Good. It's a little loud. Good morning, everybody. Rebecca Clayfish is back uh, for round three with our casual chats with uh, Rebecca here on Dreadwire today, Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. Special thank you to our previous guests so far this month. Uh, that includes Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald, Spooner Health CEO Mike Schaefer, Congressman Tom Tiffany, uh, former Representative Romaine Quinn, former Representative Adam Jarko, and former Senator Patty Schachner. And one week from today, the Senator from the 25th and current Senate Minority Leader Janet Buley will be joining me for a chat. You can watch a recording of all of our live shows on our website at drydenware.com, our Facebook page, which you're probably watching right now, uh, or on our Drydenware YouTube channel. But today... Very excited to welcome back for the third time on our show, Rebecca Clayfish. Rebecca, good morning. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Beth? I'm fantastic. It's raining uh, this morning, so that's really good because we need rain desperately. But it's a gorgeous yeah. morning in northwest Wisconsin. I don't know where you are right now, but it's gorgeous up here. How about you? It is beautiful. It's overcast, but we desperately need the rain here, too. And, you know, our winter week over on the side of our flat line is just desperate so Ugh. we'll take it yeah no kidding we'll take it so what has been new you were on uh, for the first time i think it was in september of last year and then earlier this year january february so what's been new with you all the things Ben. i have been traveling the state nearly non-stop and for two purposes i have a couple of different hats that i wear that i will take off and put on during our conversation i'm the president of the 1848 project which is building the conservative policy agenda for wisconsin's future we have now had 39 listening sessions across the great state of wisconsin hearing directly from the people what they want in the policy agenda for wisconsin's future because the best policy is dictated from the people to the government and not the other way around what? and we're working with some scholars and experts right now to determine the constitutionality and the viability of all these really awesome ideas and we're hoping to have what we will call the forward agenda built out for you all by the end of summer if you want to learn more about it please check us out at 1848project.org and then as you are also well aware I've been doing a lot of work with candidates. Last year, I recruited 25 candidates to run for Wisconsin Assembly with the hopes that we would get to veto-proof majorities and shut Governor Tony Evers down early. We didn't make that goal, but um, I started this little political action committee called Rebecca Pack. Here I go with another hat. And we were able to get folks to wrap themselves around this idea of crowdfunding these challenger campaigns. And we were able to give to these 25 candidates. We wound up being able to give to all candidates running as conservatives in the Assembly and the Senate. And then in April, we were able to go after a bunch of school board seats and town council seats, judgeships. And we're looking to continue that movement. Sure. I know Milwaukee Magazine did a really nasty article about how I meddled in nonpartisan races all across the state. And then two days ago, we had another one come out from the Racine Journal Times. But listen, this is not meddling. This is caring deeply about all levels of government where there is overreach. And if it takes a little bit of hustle and teamwork, so be it. So what do you mean meddling? Or I should say what? do they mean by what they meddling? Mean by meddling? Yeah, because I haven't well, seen those. So what was that about? It meant that I talked to these candidates. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Pack endorsed these candidates in nonpartisan races. And when we endorse a candidate, we send them a check so they can buy yard signs and literature so they can do more doors. Because mm -hmm. I have a rule that's widely shared that he who does the most doors wins in mm -hmm. local races. And... These folks are just monsters at doors. They're doing an awesome job. They're knocking on doors. They're talking to their neighbors. Their neighbors are realizing the dire straits that some of these local government offices and entities are in, and they're coming out and voting in these races. Uh, two nights ago, I was up in Shea Sortwell's district over in northeastern Wisconsin. Last night, I was helping Pat Snyder in Wausau. We need to be boots on the ground as well as people talking on social media. It's sure. not enough to just post a meme on Facebook. You gotta also be talking to your neighbors. Yeah. 
So when you have these conversations and you talk to those neighbors and you go to these listening sessions with that 1848 project and all the places that you go, what are the frequently asked questions that you get the most? And I guess I'm really more interested in you must get, you know, the most common, like three frequently asked questions from media. Um, Are those the same questions that people are asking you? I don't want to say real people because, you know, all people are real people. But are those different questions? And if so, what are those questions? Well, the folks who come to listening sessions, Ben, mm-hmm. aren't asking questions. They came to tell me what they want done. And I kind of love that about the passion of our electorate today. They feel very unheard. They feel unlistened to. And when someone is coming to their area, willing to just sit down and ask them questions, mm. hear their opinions and write them down, knowing that we're building an agenda that we seek to be a direct reflection of their hopes, their dreams for this state, make they feel happy. And the the top three things that I have been hearing is we need election integrity. We need to make sure that it is easy to vote, but hard to cheat. These are not crazy concepts. Democrats and Republicans alike should be in favor of this, conservatives and liberals. Everyone should value election integrity. Mm -hmm. The next thing I hear is about education reform. People are peeved. Parents are absolutely angry. Over the last year and a half, they have seen their kids endure learning loss. They're still paying full freight on their property taxes for their kids' education, and they don't feel like their kids got any. I mean, even pre-pandemic, if you looked at our numbers, 41% of our kids were testing at grade level for English language arts. And yet we gave the state superintendent of public schools a promotion and made him our governor. And now our children have endured a year and a half of learning loss, epidemics of anxiety and depression. We've seen kids commit suicide. We've seen children be denied team sports activities. And all of this has basically been encouraged by teachers union bosses who the governor has just listened to without questioning. And notice I'm real careful there, Ben, not to say teachers. I say teachers union bosses because I'm sure I, like you, have a lot of friends who are teachers. And they got into teaching because they care deeply about children and their hearts have broken over the last year watching their students not learn be disappointed, be disillusioned, and upset by what has happened. And so I see a huge break between the leadership of these entities and the line workers of these entities. It's terribly disappointing and specifically disappointing because the governor's only listening to these union bosses. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that I hear most about, safety, lawlessness in the state. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about making sure that we keep good cops on the streets, but that's what people are worried about. I mean, they've seen the governor's reaction to lawlessness in this state. They've seen him fan the flames of riots and culture wars. And I think average Wisconsinites are saying, I've had enough. I don't need crime spilling over into my community or my favorite tourist destination to bring Mm. my family. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to bring that up. It's the only thing I know for sure that I want to bring up. I mean, we usually don't have like questions written down, just, you know, a couple of topics. So I actually had two down, and that was I wanted your response about uh, Governor Evers, Evers's um, budget. I shouldn't say his budget, but w- the budget that is now finished. And I'm, I guess really I'm looking for a good, bad, and the ugly. So when this is done, obviously there were a number of vetoes in there, but give us a good, a bad, and the ugly from this uh, budget or Evers doing what he had done. The good, obviously, is the fact that the Republican majorities in the legislature wrote this budget. That's the good, because Governor Evers was forced to sign a tax cut. It makes us slightly more tax competitive with our neighboring states and brings us to a slightly flatter tax code. Right now, we're looking at an economy where people get to choose where they work, Ben. The days of everyone driving into a big city at a high rise to do their work from a cubicle, that's over. And so if we are to ask people to choose Wisconsin for their remote work work destination, we've got to make sure that 
we've got the tax code that's going to actually keep people here. When they can choose Texas or Florida with no income tax at all, why are they going to choose Wisconsin? Well, we have spectacular natural resources. We have so much fun in the summer. Every festival, the greatest outdoor music festival on earth, the largest farmer's market on earth right here in Wisconsin. We can do it all. But interestingly enough, we also can do it all in winter. We have all four seasons. I think we have a ton to offer, except we kind of mess things up when it comes to our income tax code. So this was a really good budget when it came to that tax cut. It was a good budget when it came to public K-12. But you asked for the bad and the ugly. Um, the bad is that the governor vetoed the personal property tax out of this budget. If you're not a small business owner, you maybe don't know what the personal property tax is. That is all the movable stuff in someone's business. Let's say you and I go into a coffee shop. Well, that coffee shop owner is a small business owner, and that coffee shop owner bought like a latte machine. That coffee shop owner bought some tables and chairs for us to sit on. Do you know that they pay taxes on those things? Mm -hmm. You know that they paid taxes when they bought those things, right? Mm -hmm. But now they're, they're paying personal property tax because they, they own them as a part of their business. The governor vetoed that and said, eh, small business, small business. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of typical of Governor Evers. We saw him pass judgment on small businesses versus large businesses in the pandemic when he ruled some small businesses non-essential and big businesses essential. And it's kind of, um, well, it's insulting for our small business owners. It's frustrating. So that's the bad. The ugly, Tony Evers' executive budget. In Wisconsin, we do an every two year budget and our process is that the executive branch, the governor, puts out his own budget first before the legislature puts out their budget. But it's actually the legislature's budget built by what we call the Joint Finance Committee, which is folks from both the Senate and the Assembly who get together and build this budget that actually gets voted on by the governor. But first, the governor puts out his own version, his own blueprint of the budget. There wasn't a lot of pomp around it this year because remember, Governor Tony Evers releases everything on videotape and then just puts it on the internet. So he doesn't do a big budget address in a joint session of the legislature. So for folks who missed it, this is the ugly. Governor Tony Evers' executive budget actually raised taxes by a billion dollars. It ended Wisconsin's right to work status and it completely stripped Act 10. If you know anything about Act 10 at all, then Ben, you know that I became the only Lieutenant Governor in American history to face and, and defeat a recall oh, right. election. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, Act 10 has now saved Wisconsinites more than 15 billion dollars. And, you know, we have one of the only fully funded pension systems in America. So ending stuff like that, that's the ugly. Mm. There you go. Good, bad, and ugly. Well, well so if he uh, announces that stuff first, you know, his budget, uh, and I'm assuming Walker did the same thing, and every governor in Wisconsin has done the same thing. Um, give us the political reason for doing this, because if clearly that's not going to get done or very likely not going to get done. It's just a political thing, right? Just to rally his own base. Is that the reason for doing these? And not specifically Evers here, but is that kind of the reason that they do this? No, um, oh. I, I would say in, in general terms, it is a hopeful blueprint that the executive oh. branch indeed puts out. Okay. At least that's what it was from our standpoint. We spent, or we spent, pardon me, months and months and months around a, a massive conference table in the governor's conference room. I sat right next to the governor and our budget team around us making decisions about what we would like to see in Wisconsin's two-year spending plan. And then the legislature largely you know, adopted the same themes and ideas. Now, we've got a, a split governance in Madison right now, and you don't have um, really any sort of collegiality. The governor, Tony Evers, decided that he was going to secretly record a meeting with legislative leaders very early in his tenure, and you saw trust broken. That kind of thing is just not done. Sure. It's almost unheard of. Very you know, suspicious, weird activity, and he's never revealed who it was. And so there are clearly some suspicions there. And so now um, he won't even really sit and listen 
to legislative leaders. They make appeals to him constantly, and he doesn't listen. He doesn't sit down with them, and it's very unfortunate. So when he put out this document, you would guess that there was some sort of political motivation sure, behind yeah. his executive budget. But honestly, Ben, when I look at that executive budget, I'm confused by his logic or lack thereof because he put out a leftist document that catered to fanatics on the fringes of his party with things like the repeal of Act 10, the billion dollar tax increase, increasing the budget, budget over budget by 9%. These are things that are just not appealing to a general election sure. voter. Yeah. Most Wisconsinites are smart enough to realize that we're still in a tax hell and we'd like to get out. So all of these things were very much offered up as sacrifices to the far left. It was very odd reasoning to me. And he of course knew that it wouldn't pass muster in the legislature. It was almost as if he anticipated a primary opponent and he wanted to run far to the left with this document. Hmm. It was odd and it looks nothing like the budget that was actually passed. Now, sure. do I see a political reason for him signing the vast majority of the budget that the legislature handed him? Absolutely I do, because he's going to try and claim that he's the education governor, despite the fact that he allowed the shutdown of Wisconsin schools for a year and a half. He was the architect of a status quo with the failure rates and kids not even performing up to grade level. He also lost track of thousands of poor students across the state just not even having their addresses so that these school districts could follow up with their nutrition benefits so these kids could get their free school lunches. It's, it's almost unbelievable sure. some of the education failures that we have seen in this state if it weren't for the fact that they're actually true. So honestly, I don't, I don't understand what the governor was doing there. Uh, we could talk about budget all day. Maybe ask I, I, Jana Dooley next week. Uh, what am I asking her? What the governor was thinking with that what executive budget. What was governor thinking? Got it. <laughs> I got but, it written down. Jana Dooley actually voted for yeah. this budget. So I don't know. I, I would love to see somebody like Romaine Quinn run against Jana Dooley. I think that would be uh, a race for the ages. Oh, do you think he will? I don't know. I haven't talked to him about uh. it, but... You, you might want to have him on your show and tell him he ought to think about it. Man, he was a co-host on our uh, with Congressman Tom Tiffany for our Breakfast with Tiffany. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a real creative mind when it comes to naming these shows. Um, boy, I should have asked him. Yeah, last I heard, you know, he had, a, he had a kid and everything's going great in his real estate. He's doing that. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if he wanted to get back into that. Yeah, that would be. Uh, anyway, um, I want to get to other things because we're already a little behind just because I want to make sure uh, that we get to specifically this one. And, and I wrote down maybe another one here, too. But law enforcement, uh, when it comes to qualified immunity, obviously there's a national narrative. Maybe that's kind of calmed down a little bit in terms of national media um, that has, you know, doesn't really paint law enforcement in the with a with a. I don't know. It's a really weird thing that was kind of happening. And maybe some of that was justified in terms of some isolated incidents. But all I can speak for is Northwest Wisconsin, not even Southern Wisconsin or anywhere else. We, for the most part, we have gigantic support for law enforcement. And I have uh, had the wonderful opportunity of getting to know both professionally and personally, sheriffs, chiefs of police, etc., people in command or in leadership positions in law enforcement in our area. And one of the things that continues to come up is the topic of qualified immunity. As in, I've even had a couple of them, maybe three, that have said, if that goes away, they go away, as in we're leaving because it's not worth the job anymore. What is your view? What is your opinion on qualified immunity, specifically when it comes to law enforcement right now? So folks at home know qualified immunity is basically when we put good cops on the streets and they are doing their jobs. As you know, immunity makes you immune from being charged and going to court over basically doing what you are doing. And in this case, cops are doing their jobs. We know that police and sheriff's deputies have incredibly dangerous jobs. It puts them in tough situations of having to make split second decisions to protect all of us because they were the ones who said, send me into these terrible and, and many times rough situations. Mm. 
And so qualified immunity basically protects good cops in almost, well, many, many of these situations. Yeah. They have to make split second decisions and they're trying to make the best decisions based on hours upon hours upon hours of rigorous training. And so qualified immunity is one of those things that good police officers need to have in the back of their mind before they go into work every day. I, I want to see no change at all to qualified immunity because you strip qualified immunity and already an, an employment crisis, a hiring crisis in law enforcement sure. is in existence. It's going to get even worse. You know, I, I talk to folks in our urban areas as well, Ben. It's nearly impossible for them to find the recruits that they need just to keep enough officers on the streets. The overtime crises are getting worse as yeah. well. And this is just going to ding budgets. And you see these cities right now in urban blue areas where they're saying, oh, we ought to do an exercise in budgeting where we defund the police or reduce our police budget. Well, just to keep the officers you have on the streets is going to be nearly impossible with the budget you have because of the overtime hours. On top of that, we're seeing crime rates rise. When you see the rhetoric out of someone like Governor Tony Evers, who fans the flames of these riots and culture wars, so much so that after the police involved shooting down in Kenosha, mm -hmm. where the video was widely seen, and he releases a statement uh -huh. saying terrible things about the officers involved, uh, you had police from across Wisconsin come out the next day and say, hey, Governor, you need to stop doing that. We have three branches of government and the justice branch is actually charged with investigating these things, not the executive branch. So thanks for your opinion, but no thanks. Yeah. Let government do its job because our founders designed something terrific. They'll handle it from there, yeah. thanks. So we need to keep qualified immunity. We need to keep good cops on the streets. We need to assure that we are defending good cops and not defunding law enforcement, which protects us from this crime spilling over. There's a reason why murder rates in Milwaukee and Madison are going up then. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, we've never, you know, we don't take sides right away. We never have. Some people, you know, we get emails saying that we're leftist, this and that, and, and spewing propaganda. And the other side say that we're right wing. So it doesn't matter. It's just kind of equal. So that's fine. We'll take it. Um, there's some things that governor has done, uh, Governor Evers, that we have said, yeah, that, that makes sense. We would support that or that probably a good reason or doing it for the right reasons. Uh, to be honest, that was one. Uh, that press release that he sent out after that, uh, I remember just going... Really? Is that, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, that's not helping at all, but I, I don't know. That was an interesting thing. But you had brought up about, uh, in regards to qualified immunity, uh, you had stated, basically it's a fact that we all know this right now, that it's very difficult for uh, law enforcement, um, municipalities, or sheriff's offices to get uh, to get applicants. It's, it's been going down and down and down. Um, that kind of leads to, I don't know, is there a, a kind of a crisis of trying to get people hired for law enforcement? But potentially a bigger topic here is I've heard people say that there is a current labor crisis. They have to describe it as a crisis. Do you subscribe to that, that we have an actual labor crisis right now? Yes, the numbers prove it. What I hear traveling the state every single day proves it. But funny enough, Governor Evers' campaign came out on Twitter a few days ago saying that what I have been saying about the current labor market situation is nonsense. Imagine the leader of your state saying a labor market crisis is nonsense. But that's indeed what his campaign said about very plain numbers. We have a crisis because Governor Tony Evers has continued, despite the fact the governors all across this country have ended the $300 a week booster on top of unemployment insurance to encourage more people to jump back into the labor force. He, he's vetoed that. When that came to his desk, something that's logical, even Louisiana's Democrat governor said, by all means, we need more people into our workforce. He said, nope, nope, let's keep people in their houses on unemployment insurance. And it made sense, Ben, in the middle of the pandemic, 
Sure. Yeah. The logical thing that government thought was, hey, you know what? Let's keep keep people away from you know close contact with each other. Let's wait this thing out. And so you could almost see where they were going with it. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I, I have a buddy who owns a bar who is now paying twenty dollars an hour to his backstage staff. So his prep cooks and his fry chefs, his line cooks, twenty dollars an hour to his backstage folks, and he still has to shut down three days a week. Please. That is not uncommon at all. I was mm-hmm. I was in the middle of one of our, our policy meetings online with people from across the state. Um, it was on, on transportation. And one of the women in my meeting, as I am reading this tweet from Governor Evers' campaign staff about him saying that it is nonsense, that we have a, a will gap, not a skills gap, that we need more people, not only in our counted in our unemployment rate, but also in our labor market participation rate. Because when you're out on the sidelines, you don't count in those rates. And I think some folks need some basic, you know, government accounting lessons. Not that government is really great at anything, (laughs) but that's how these numbers are in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, you know, the woman who was on the Zoom call is like, oh my goodness. How out of touch can you be? I could hire 40 people right now, and I'm not even getting the applicants. Occasionally, people will get applicants just so they can check the box so that when they are offered the job, they can refuse it. Then we have disincentives all over the place. Yeah, We have an area of business. Needs to be no leadership. Yeah, we have an area of business, and I've talked to several, but one specifically, um, I suppose it's relevant who it is, but it's, it's in our area. And they have been around for like 40 years and they are now, they closed for a week. They had other days, like you had said about that, that your friend who owns the bar where they've had to obviously change their hours, um, close down on different days. And when I asked them, you know, what was this kind of from? And of course it was, we just don't get any applicants, like an occasional one. And then if we call them, we don't get a call back, but it was just the shortage. And I've heard this before uh, in the last few months, I've read about it before. But they were the first ones when they brought something up to me uh, that really took me back a little bit. And they said, you know, we made it through the shutdown. We made it through COVID. We made it through all of this and we're kept told and we use personal money and loans. So we made it through. But yet now our business may not survive. It's the post. I don't want to call it post pandemic because there's still, you know, things going on. But. Uh, they were really surprised. They thought, boy, if we can just get to this point, and for the most part, America's kind of back open, at least up in northwest Wisconsin. There's festivals and uh, whatnot, and things have been more lax, which you could argue is good or bad, but it is what it is. We didn't think we'd be in the spot right now. Now we can't even get employees. So, And we don't know what to do. We can only raise our, uh, how much we can offer someone so much. And it's like, this is just ridiculous. We're not going to pay somebody $40 an hour to do this job. So we, it's just crazy to think about that you make it through it. And now this is like the, the phase two of kind of the reopening. And, and now is when you're actually hurting. Are you seeing that in other areas as well? 100%. It's like the shutdown hangover that oh, we didn't need to have. But I think Governor Evers' administration has just not listened and they didn't stop when Wisconsin said stop. And so now the state winds up with a hangover. I was in Northeastern Wisconsin two days ago in Wrightstown at a coffee shop and the owner Deb told me, you know, I'm actually doing okay on my labor. I hire people who are only over 18, fairly responsible folks. So I'm actually okay on labor because that was the first thing that I asked her because that's very typical. The people say, I'm really suffering on labor. She's suffering on supply chain. Now in the Joe Biden America, uh, we're also seeing huge supply chain problems. And part of that is labor. And so for her producers of everything from the little filters that she uses for coffee to you know flour for her baked goods, sugar, um, some of the syrups that she gets, you know she's struggling because the cost of those has all skyrocketed. Mm. Part of that is because the the syrup maker can't hire enough workers, or part of that is because their ingredients have gotten more expensive. Commodity prices for certain things 
have gone up. And so when those prices skyrocket, or you know, you've probably heard of our driver shortage, mm -hmm. just to try and get those things delivered to the store, the restaurant supply store, even your grocery store has gotten more expensive because there's scarcity of people willing to be drivers and get commercial driver's licenses. So the supply chain has been suffering as well from this labor market shortage and prices going up. So she's sitting there wondering, well, I have enough workers to make the coffees and the baked goods, but I, and my margin is just going away. She's like, I paid myself for the first time in four years. What was she I'm thinking? I'm a small business owner. Well, she was a missionary <laughs> before this. And yeah. so what she was thinking is, oh, this is my service to the right. community. Yeah. This is the thing that I can give. This is where I can spread the good news and you know the community can come and, and share and gather. So she paid herself for the very first time, but now she's watching her margin shrink so much so that if she's only making you know one cent per coffee or two cents per scone or donut, then how is she supposed to pay her workers then? But then on top of that, if her margin goes away, she's going to have to pass those increases on to her customer. Yeah. And now we're talking about inflation, and that is the other edge of a double-edged yeah. sword. So what we have seen out of Joe Biden and Tony Evers is nothing but economic bad. It's poor decision after poor decision. It's failed leadership. We need something better. We need something more aspirational. N know anyone that would be interested in that job? I do. Oh, nice. Can you, can you tell us who it is? Um, I, I think that what we need to do right now is dig deep into great policy ideas like okay. those that we're going to put out for the forward agenda of the 1848 sure. project and find the person, the people, the team, the family that will take the ideas of the people built into the forward agenda and put those center stage sure. because the people of Wisconsin deserve to be center stage, not these liberal activists like Tony Evers and Joe Biden. We don't want a Marxist state. We don't want a Marxist country. You, know, you see what's going on in Cuba right now. Those folks are standing their mm. ground. They're saying, Cuba, you need to change. We're not all leaving. Yep. And I think that's what we need to do here in Wisconsin. Okay. Say, government, you need to change. We're not all leaving. Last thing for you. Um, what is the, uh, let's just say hypothetically, uh, you're the governor right now. You haven't been able to get anything done yet because you get, it's uh, at noon today you become Wisconsin's governor for whatever reason. It's just it's a fun hypothetical scenario. And at two o'clock this afternoon, you have to get up and give a state of the state address. What are you saying? I would say the state of the state is resilient. If it weren't resilient, then the people of Wisconsin would not have been able to produce a $4.4 billion surplus, despite the fact that Tony Evers told people from a decree on high that you are essential and you are not. Despite the fact that the unemployment insurance system absolutely broke down under Tony Evers and some phone calls weren't even answered and people were having to ask friends and neighbors to help make ends meet. Mm. Despite the fact that we have seen an epidemic of anxiety and depression and learning loss among our children and our most vulnerable. Despite all of that, Wisconsin is resilient. And when we put Wisconsinites first, their ideas as our priorities, as the forward agenda will, and man, there's nothing we can't do all together. Making it up to Northwest Wisconsin anytime soon? Well, I was, I wouldn't say West, but I was in Wausau yesterday. I'm going to be in Vilas County, I think, on Tuesday. Hold on. Uh, I know I'm going to Stevens Point after that. I'll tell you because I have my phone in front of uh, me. Barron, Burnett, Sawyer, Polk, oh, Rusk, I, Washburn mm, County. I don't think that I am going to be. Although, did you know there was a, a police involved shooting in Barron County? Yeah. So you should read DrydenWire.com more often. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I read it on DrydenWire.com. Yeah, I'll get you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, but, yeah, there um, was. The, the problem there is. We got a mental health crisis that was only exacerbated by the shutdown, and that's a problem. So it looks like I'm doing. Yeah, yeah this is in Anago, so that's that's more central east. Um, 
Let's see. Eagle River, Vilas County, Pines and Politics. This is all next week. Uh, Stevens Point. Uh, looks like I'm going up to Lodi um, over in John Plummer's district, then back up. It's an aggressive schedule. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I don't see my family a lot. Today I'm actually going down to Dixon, I, Illinois, oh. the birthplace of Ronald Reagan, uh, to speak for uh, the Young America's Foundation. So Governor sure. Scott Walker right. is yeah. bringing young conservatives from across the country to Dixon. And I'm going to go down there and talk to them about Here's the great coincidence, making good decisions. Yeah, that'd be nice. That's always good. My wife always is reminding me of that. Ben, it's not just about your decisions. Here. You need to make good ones. And I don't know. I'm still learning. I'm trying to figure it out. Thanks so much. Anything else that you want to uh, uh, talk on or leave our uh, audience with? Yes, Ben. If uh, your audience could just go to 1848project.org and give us a piece of their mind. Uh, we have not put um, all of the dots on the I's and all of the crosses on the T's. Uh, we are in um, kind of the, the middle to, to late part of the process where we've done close to 40 listening sessions and we've done a lot of surveys, but we are still eager for input. And if you have the idea that is going to make Wisconsin the star of the Midwest once again, we want to include your ideas. We want the forward agenda to be a direct mirror, a reflection of Wisconsin, because Wisconsinites are something special. Yeah. Yes, I am, because I'm a Wisconsin. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rebecca, so much. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. My pleasure. Awesome. Special thank you to our guest today, Rebecca Clayfish, and thank all of you, of course, for watching. I will see you next Tuesday for another episode of Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy. And reminder, next Thursday, I'll be chatting with Senate Minority Leader Janet Bewley. Until then, stay safe, stay positive, and as always, have a blessed day.